From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Yeah, cheers, Ollie. Thanks very much. Welcome to uh, Wednesday's Richie Allen Show. What a day it's been, eh? September the 4th, 2019. Lots going on in the UK's House of Commons, the House of Parliament, right now. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. This is your Richie Allen Show. You know that. You can tweet it right now. It's at Richie Allen Show. That is my Twitter handle. Love to hear from you today. Two terrific guests lined up for you on the programme. I think you'll be glad to hear them. Let's get on with it then. Richie Allen. Yeah, good stuff. Let's do it then. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now... Here's your host, Richie Allen. Now, to make sense of all this Brexit madness, to talk a little bit about the Hong Kong protests and news that Chief Executive Carrie Lam has said that the controversial extradition bill will basically disappear, giving the protesters what they wanted. Uh, Tony Gosling uh, will join me uh, very shortly, in fact, in about 20 minutes' time or thereabouts. And returning to the Richie Allen show a little bit later on, the author Charlie Robinson is back on the programme. I loved hearing from him last year. He came on to talk about his excellent book, The Octopus of Global Control. He's back on the programme in the second hour. We'll talk Jeffrey Epstein, Prince Andrew, Ghislaine Maxwell, and much more with uh, Charlie Robinson in the second hour. I've given you the Twitter handle, so there's, um, well, there's little else for me to do but just jump straight into the headlines. So there is. Are you well, by the way? I'm not sure how much cricket was played today at Old Trafford in Manchester. I think they're currently playing. 98 for 2, the Aussies were before rain, delayed it before lunch. It's been a miserable old day it has in Greater Manchester. But you haven't come here to hear about the cricket. No, you haven't. You haven't. So remain members of Parliament across opposition parties, along with 21 Conservative Party rebels, last night voted to take control of the business of the House of Commons. And they did that so that they could debate and vote on a bill, which they've been doing today. They're debating anyway. The vote comes later. That vote will be on whether to prevent the UK leaving with no deal, basically cutting the legs out from under the government, and also to ask the European Union for a three-month extension, meaning we wouldn't leave on October 31st, we would leave, well, we're never going to leave, but it would be put back to January 31st. you understand that? <laughs> All right. So Remainers, and not the government proposing legislation today, not the way it is done, but the European Union loving speaker John Berko has allowed all of this to happen. So here we are. An election? Question mark, question mark. An election? Well, having lost last night, Boris Johnson signalled his intent to ask the House to vote for an early general election. You heard Ollie Barrett there say correctly that he needs the support of two-thirds of MPs for that election to be called. There will be a vote on that later on tonight as well. Now, Johnson will most likely lose that. But that doesn't mean that there will not be an election. Are you confused, are you? Confused.com, are you? Let Sky News political editor Beth Rigby explain it for you. She's good, Beth. She cuts through the detritus and explains it very well, Beth Rigby. This is to push through a bill which would block Boris Johnson from a no-deal exit on October the 31st if he fails to get a deal uh, with Brussels before that deadline. And it would compel the Prime Minister to go back to Brussels and ask for a three-month extension uh, to Brexit until January the 31st, something Boris Johnson has repeatedly and repeated today and last night night not prepared to do. But in terms of expectation of what do we think will happen, well when you've got a, a vote that you lose by 28 and you have to sack 21 of your MPs, uh, including Sir Nicholas Soames, Winston Churchill's grandson, yeah. uh, and the man that was once running the Treasury just a few weeks ago. Uh, if, you're ready to, if they're ready to go over the top, I think it's pretty nailed on uh, that this bill 
will pass. Uh, then after that, we've got another big moment uh, whereby uh, there will then be a debate on the Fixed Term Parliament Act motion brought by the government, and that is Boris Johnson appealing to the Commons to allow him to call an early general election. You need two-thirds of MPs to vote for that. But what we're also pretty confident about, because... Labour have made it really clear, actually, is that that will not pass. So we're going to end the day, and it could be very late, it could be into the early hours of yeah. next morning, um, with Boris Johnson uh, blocked on a no-deal Brexit on October the 31st and also blocked on his escape option, uh, which is to call a general election. So he'll have... Where does that leave him? Well, but that, so that's what we, we know. That's what we know. So he'll lose twice tonight. MPs will vote to stop no deal and to send Johnson back to Brussels for an extension. And they should vote against him calling an election. But that doesn't mean there won't be an election. Beth Rigby explains. And I think what will happen in the next few days is that once that bill uh, is passed, if it does get rural assent, that's the uh, blocking a no deal exit bill, uh, then Labour will be prepared to go to the polls in a general election. They are not going to allow uh, Boris Johnson to try and frame the Labour Party as an anti-democratic, pro-establishment uh, party on the side of those who want to uh, reverse the Brexit vote. We know the Labour Party have to have face both ways on Brexit. They have to appeal to leave voters and remain voters. Boris Johnson's clearly going on a more populist route of recasting the Conservatives as the Vote Leave Party. I mean, he just wants to get a big chunk of the 52% who voted to leave in the referendum to support him in an election. It's like a 35% strategy yeah. to try and get over the line and Labour will want to recast the election as a bigger issue about the future of the country and they will hope that their retail offer to voters will appeal that they can move this election beyond Brexit. So these are the battle lines that are forming and I think from the Labour Party's perspective they genuinely believe they can beat Boris Johnson. They've been calling for an election for ages so once they are assured that there can't be uh, a no deal exit on October the 31st. Uh, I think they will allow that election. How it comes about, we can talk about. Of course, with a um, siren. We can talk about different options. There's different options how it can come about. But in the big picture, I I'm expecting a general election to be called in the next few days. Are you? I am, uh, yeah. She is. So basically, he lose twice tonight. Once MPs vote tonight to stop no deal, and to send them back to Brussels for an extension, it goes to the upper house, it goes to the House of Lords. If it passes the House of Lords, which it should do, it then gets royal assent, it becomes law. So she's saying, at that point, Corbyn will say, bring on an election. Although I did hear talk today of filibustering in the House of Lords this evening. What's filibustering, Richie, when it's at home? Well, it's when people talk unmitigated bollocks for as long as they possibly can to delay the passing of a bill. It's an obstructionist tactic, basically. And because most of the Lords in the House of Lords have been talking bollocks their entire lives, if they want to go down that route, well, they, they should be able to do it. But I'm not sure that's going to be uh, the way it goes tonight. Johnson will lose twice. The assent will be given to the stopping of no deal and then we'll get an election. That's what I think. I think Rigby basically described that very eloquently. That's what's going to happen. After the election, what might the result be? A Corbyn-led coalition, maybe? A coalition of the Conservative Party with the Brexit Party, maybe? Maybe not. The Brexit Party to destroy the Conservative Party? Maybe, maybe not. You can check out any time you like, eh? Today being Wednesday, today being Wednesday, it was Prime Minister's Questions. Uh, there was a bit of fun and games at PMQs today. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, went on the attack and had a few choice words for Jeremy Corbyn. Obviously, Johnson was a bit sore about the way things went last night. And he had an ad hominem, an ad hominem attack. So he did plan for Boris, uh, excuse me, for Jeremy Corbyn. Here's Boris Johnson. But Mr Speaker, I know he's worried about free trade deals with America, but there's only one chlorinated chicken that I can see in this house. <laughs> And he's on that bench. Will he confirm again? He's a chlorinated chicken. Johnson gets very hysterical, doesn't he, when he's calling people names. He gets very, very hysterical. Chlorinated chicken. Will he confirm? Will he confirm? 
And then he calls him a big girl's blouse, but you can't hear it. Johnson calls Corbin a big girl's blouse. It's the puppet show. <laughs> He's doing that now. He's mouthing, you big girl's blouse, call an election. <laughs> big girl's he thinks, blouse. Uh, we think that the friends of this country are to be found in Paris and in Berlin and in the White House. And he thinks that they're in the Kremlin and in Tehran and in... And in And I think he's Caracas, uh, Mr. Speaker. He, he's, frit, he's frightened. Or is he frit? I think the sledging has deteriorated disgracefully, hasn't it? If that is as witty as it gets, I think he's Caracas. To be honest with you, I'd prefer to be friends with Tehran, Caracas, Damascus, Tripoli, Baghdad. I'd prefer to have friends there than friends in Washington, D.C., but that's just me. Because the, those in Tehran, those in Tripoli, those in Caracas, those in Baghdad, well, they're not responsible for the deaths of millions and millions of people every year through sanctions and mass murder. So if Corbyn is choosing his friends in the Kremlin, in, in Moscow, and in Tehran, etc., I think Corbyn's got a, I don't know, I think he measures, he, he chooses his friends more wisely than maybe Boris Johnson, but that's just me. Corbyn wanted to remind Johnson that he just that he'd just sacked 21 of his own MPs. If the Prime Minister does to the country what he's done to his party in the past 24 hours, I think a lot of people have a great deal to fear from his incompetence, his vacillation and his refusal to publish known facts that are known to him about the effects of a no-deal Brexit. Yeah, right. Let's move away from Brexit for a minute, because I, I know it's way it's wearing you down. It is getting on top of you now. I know it is getting right on top of you. And you're cheesed off with it. But it is important. But we'll leave Brexit for the minute, because there was um, another bit of hilarity at Prime Minister's questions today. Uh, Tanmanjeet Singh Desi is a Sikh, and he's a Labour MP representing Slough. <laughs> David Brent Town. Will Slough forevermore be remembered for the office? It probably will. So Tanmanjeet Singh Desi is a Labour MP from Slough. He's a Sikh, which is important that you know that because he doesn't sound any different to anybody else you might hear, but then then why would he, of course? Um, but he is a Sikh. And he wanted to take Boris Johnson to task over racism. I hear you're a racist now, Boris. And comments that Johnson has made in the past about Muslim women and how they dress. This got a bit frantic as well. I should teach these people how to rant. I could write a book on ranting. Here's Tanmanjeet Singh Desi taking Johnson to task over his racism, don't you know? Mr Speaker, if I decide to wear a turban, or you decide to wear a cross, or he decides to wear a kippah or a skullcap, or she decides to wear a hijab or a burqa, does that mean that it is open season for right honourable members of this House to make <laughs> derogatory and divisive remarks about our appearance? For those of us who from a young age have had to endure and face up to being called names such as Towelhead, Towelhead. or Taliban, Taliban or coming from Bongo Bongo Land, Bongo, we can Bongo appreciate Land. full well the hurt and pain. Bongo Bongo Land. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Is he really crying about being a child, being on a playground, and another child saying, you come from Bongo Bongo land. Is he really declaring that to be hurtful? Jesus, you'd have thought a member of parliament would have thicker skin. Anyway, he escalates the hysteria, and it's quite comical. Pain felt by already vulnerable Muslim women when they are described as looking like bank robbers and letterboxes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so rather than hide behind sham and whitewash investigations, when will the Prime Minister finally apologise for his derogatory and racist remarks? Which They're applauding the Labour bench. The, the Labour backbenchers are applauding this crap. Well done. He's not finished either. Go on, Tan. <laughs> you tell him, boy. 
racist remarks, Mr. Speaker. Do you think Owen Jones wrote this question for us? Which have led to a spike in hate crime. Yeah. And given the increasing prevalence of yeah. such incidents within his... He's, his voice is at the top of its range now, right? Within his party, when will the Prime Minister finally order an inquiry into Islamophobia... An inquiry? ...phobia within the Conservative Party, something which he and his Chancellor promised on national television? Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Jesus, huh? Imagine it. So what did, what did Johnson... Johnson is a proper Amadon, as we would say, in Ireland. Look it up. An Amadon. Awful Egypt, Johnson. What did he say in response to Tanmanjeet's hysterical question? Minister. Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker. If we... Order. 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 The response from the Prime Minister will be heard. The Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, can I, can I just say to the uh, honourable gentleman that if he took the trouble to read the article in question, he would see that it was a strong liberal defence, as he uh, began his question by saying, of everybody's right to wear whatever they want in this country. And I speak as somebody who is not only proud to have uh, Muslim ancestors, but to be related to Sikhs uh, such, as, uh, such as himself. And I'm also proud, Mr Speaker, to say that under this government, we have the most diverse, the most diverse cabinet in the history of this country. This is what it's all going to end up as in the future. This is actually a little glimpse into the UK in about 10 to 15 years. Everything is going to revolve around race, identity, gender. It's all going to be about that. Every issue, no matter whether it's a political issue, an economic issue, it's going to be framed around whether those taking part in the debate have declared themselves to be on the right side of, as I said, gender discussions, discussions around racial identity and all the rest of it. This is where we're all going. I mean, this is unbelievable. Can you imagine 25, 30, 40 years ago, if you took politicians, parliamentarians, and gave them a little television and showed them this nonsense happening in September of 2019, talking about diversity, and obviously he's going to go down the road of anti-Semitism, John Johnson. This is mad stuff. But then I did say we would end up here, didn't Country. I? And we, we truly reflect, we truly reflect modern Britain. We truly reflect modern Britain. Parties fighting to prove, to signal by their virtue that they are the protectors of the vulnerable. And the vulnerable is every identity group that you can possibly think of off the top of your head. This is where we're going. And Mr. Speaker, what we have yet to hear... From Here comes the anti-Semitism. Anywhere in the Labour Party is any hint of apology for the virus of anti-Semitism that is go. now rampant, now rampant in their ranks. And I, I want to hear, I would like to hear that from the Honourable Member opposite. Oh, there you are. And before we move on, 21 minutes past the air, madness that. You might remember us talking with the great Pippa King. What a lovely uh, person Pippa is, but what a very learned woman she is on privacy is Pippa. She's uh, terrific and uh, I'm glad she comes on this programme. We talked, did Pippa and I, about a man who was taking South Wales police to court because they were basically pointing automated facial recognition cameras at him, AFR technology. And he took um, this case to uh, court. He, he took it to a judicial review. Uh, well, he asked for a, a judicial review and he went to court saying, I shouldn't have to put up with this when I'm going shopping. Well, he's lost. Judges have ruled against him, uh, this man. The court refused the judicial review on all grounds, saying that South Wales Police had followed the rules and their use of AFR was justified. The High Court said this was the first time any court in the world had considered the use of the technology, which is failing miserably. It's dreadful, this facial recognition technology. Liberty, the civil rights group, said their client would basically... Uh, be be appealing. This is the man is called Ed Bridges, by the way. Um, he, he's from Cardiff. He said his human rights were breached when he was photographed 
while Christmas shopping. His legal challenge argued the use of the tool breached his human right to privacy as well as data protection and equality laws. But the court said no, the police can carry on. And that's very interesting because Cressa de Dick, who's uh, the the Commissioner of London's Metropolitan Police Service, has been speaking in Sydney, Australia. And she said that the UK risks becoming a ghastly Orwellian omniscient police state. And she gave as her reason for her stark warning, she said, well, this technology, robotics, artificial intelligence and facial recognition. How ironic. How ironic indeed. It's 23 minutes past the hour. This is the Richie Allen Show. And my name just happens to be Richie Allen. What a coincidence that is. Lou Gehrig's disease. <laughs> hey, I love you, by the way. How you doing? Thanks for joining the Richie Allen Show. Tony Gosling joins me next after this gem from Bob Seger. Welcome to the show. Hey. I do sometimes get asked. I get asked. Richie, is he your favourite artist of all time, Bob Seger? Yes, he is. I do declare it. Bob Seger is my favourite artist of all time. I love the man. Got everything on vinyl. Got the whole lot. Love him. Never get bored of him. Listen, uh, Tony Gosling is a terrific journalist. There are not many left like him in the world, let alone the UK. The host of the politics show at BCFM in Bristol. Of course, a one-time BBC journalist. Let's welcome back. He's working very hard on his own programme and some very interesting issues today in Bristol. But he's kind enough to jump out of uh, work for uh, 25 minutes or thereabouts to speak with you and me. Tony, welcome back. It's an absolute what? shit show, Brexit. What's happening? <laughs> What's going on, Tony? How do you read it? Welcome, by the way, buddy. Um, yeah, I, I would suggest um, we've got... It was the shortest interview of all time right there. That's Boris. Uh, Sorry, Tony, we lost you momentarily. We lost you momentarily for about five seconds, mate. Okay. The line dropped out, so, so uh, start again. Go ahead. All right, so I think it's fascinating to see what's been going on with this new government suddenly popping up on the scene this week. Um, I mean, it's so different to the old Theresa May government, completely different. Um, and this is because, number one, because May was never elected by the Conservative Party to be the, the leader. Secondly, because her husband, Philip, um, from Capital Group in Los Angeles was running the show yes. when, the, when it came to the Brexit negotiations. I mean, basically, she was running a Remain government, which was, you know, including people like Hammond and the rest, who were pretending to be a, a Leave government. And all the times that she said she wanted to leave the EU were lies. Um, and now we've got a government who is, whose heart is actually in it. Now, that and that has manifested itself. I think it's absolutely extraordinary over the last couple of days in some big, big tectonic plates shifting. Number one is the Labour Party changing its mind about having a general election. Yeah. So they've been calling for the last two years. Corbyn has, and you'll love this, knowing how much you uh, I love the man. suspect <laughs> Mr. Corbyn. <laughs> is, he's now changed his mind. He doesn't want a general election. And so effectively Boris has called his bluff. Now, I mean, this is, this is the wonder of politics, isn't it? Because you've got all these political class people who decide what they want to do and try and dress it up as, oh, we're just doing what the people want. Well, of course, that's not been happening ever since since the referendum result and uh, we, what we've had is a whole lo bunch of pretend thoughts and ideas from May and her friends about oh we're trying our best to leave now when the Irish backstop thing came up it was obvious that that was never going to be um, acceptable in the UK because it meant separating Northern Ireland off from the rest of the UK now I mean you know the EU and the Republic can have a go at that if they want and they can try and use the Brexit vote uh, to do that but it's never going to stick and so the other thing is I mean apart from the complete U-turn of Corbyn it's really shown that he is afraid of a general election. In a general election, it looks as if it may well be that Boris romps home. Obviously, the Brexit party might cause some problems there, but it may be that Corbyn gets a bloody nose from the electorate. And so that's, it seems to me, is what Corbyn thinks he may do. And now he's, so he's fighting shy of it. But this announcement today, Richie, by Sajid Javid, shows we've got a completely different bunch of people in charge. So ever since Cameron departed, we've had Theresa May from the Home Office, you know, who in charge of the close down of prisons, the, you know, the sacking of thousands of police, tens of thousands of police, the sacking of loads of prison officers, the close, you know, the, 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 the lack of funding of the justice system, closing loads of courts. She was behind all that. And as prime minister, 
uh, continued with all the cutbacks in public spending, we've now got uh, a bit of a more traditional Conservative Party there who realise that they need to keep these services going. They need to run the country well and effectively and properly fund public services. Otherwise, they're going to be booted out. And so that's what we've seen is this increase, a mass, massive increase in public spending of 14, nearly 14 billion today announced by Sajid Javid. And all Labour seem to be able to do is complain about it, even though it's what they've been asking for for the last, well, nine years since uh, the austerity programme started, Richie. Uh, Tony, you're absolutely spot on. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to play devil's advocate for Corbyn, amazingly enough. Um, <laughs> I, no, I am, because it's been said today that he's running scared of an election. Now, pre-2017... It looked very bad for the Labour Party in the opinion polls as well, all of them. In fact, you remember, pre-2017, pre we were told that opinion polls had been reworked because of their failures right up until 2017. They got uh, so many things wrong. They got Brexit wrong. They got the Scottish referendum wrong. And we were told that by 2017, they had fixed all the glitches in the opinion polls. And those opinion polls in 2017 suggested that Labour was going to get a shellacking in the election of 2017, and Labour didn't. And today we're being told that Labour is um, polling very, very badly, again because in the north of the country, many Labour constituencies voted to leave, and Corbyn has kind of caught between two stools, as you've said to me on the programme before. So I would say, let's not necessarily believe the polls that say Labour is doing very badly. Uh, Labour might do very well in the forthcoming general election. That momentum vote, that massive young vote, I, I mean, the 20-something the, the, the vote, the 20 to 25s, 20, 20 to 35s, they are almost universally in favour of staying in the European Union. Maybe Corbyn will come out of it, forming a coalition government maybe, supported by the Liberal Democrats, Change UK, the SNPs, and maybe some of, uh, some, 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 you, you know, maybe some independents that might win seats at the next election, Tony. Okay, so the fact remains, whatever you just said, that polls are, <laughs> mu are very, very much... Uh, you know, there's a lot of over-egging of puddings goes into polls. Yeah. But, you know, so there's a lot of money behind them. So basically, whoever pays for the poll gets the results that they want. My you point, know, that's exactly. effectively what happens. And yeah. that, that was one of the reasons why we got completely wrong polling before the election of Trump and before the Brexit referendum. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? Now, in the last general election, uh, 2017, what we had was the majority of MPs elected uh, were in leave constituencies. So the majority of, uh, of uh, MPs should be voting leave, leave in these the various votes if, yeah. they were, if they were following what the people in their constituencies voted for. But the trouble is we've got a political class that's grown up over the years that has spied this gr Brussels gravy train, this corporate gravy train, because really the big business and Brussels are the same thing. You know, that they are multinational, they're across national boundaries, that if, if there's one country that legislates against, the, uh, against um, a particular company, then that business will be moved out of that country that's the way they work it's a kind of a mafia really so they have ultimatums they'll say well look if you decide you're going to do this and bring these laws in we're off and this is the way that the bankers operate and it's the way that the big companies operate and brussels is very much the same they basically they they are the people who uh, you know make all the laws and uh, facilitate the actions of these multinational corporations. So I think what we've got is a political class, mostly, uh, you know, actually in the Labour Party, who are anti-Corbyn, they're pro-war, these are the people that vote for things like war in Syria, that kind yeah. of thing, and those are the ones who are now trying to stop Brexit. So that's actually what's really going on here. What we've got is a bunch of Remainers trying to find every different excuse to come up with why they might be pro-Brexit. Now, remember, all these people stood on a uh, we will implement the Brexit vote pl platform, both main parties at the last general that's election. Right. Yet what they're doing is totally the opposite. Now, look, Richie, just a thought experiment. Imagine if California had voted to leave the USA, uh, you know, What's happening here is really a, a, gr a kind of a crisis, really, in the as in the US, which has been obviously going for centuries, but a similar thing in in the EU, which has an arrogant attitude that they are now a corporate superstate. In fact, we had 
uh, we had Carl von Habsburg a few months ago saying, oh, this is entertaining watching the British try to leave because I know they won't be able they to. Won't. They can't. Yeah. We already control their country. So, and he was, uh, he's uh, the president of the Pan-European Union who back in the 1920s uh, formed in Munich uh, a couple of years after the Nazi, or before the Nazi party. And uh, that's be- they have been the main people, the aristocracy behind the scenes, the rich and powerful, wealthy aristocracy of Europe. He'd been trying to get this whole plan going. So that's, I think, what's really playing out here is you've got a whole political class that are bought and paid for. A lot of the political parties get their donations from these massive, powerful, pro-Brussels corporate interests. Uh, and of course, the mainstream media is exactly the same. They uh, also are going for uh, keeping their investments in tax havens, the big co- media corporations, the Daily Mail, Empire, Sky, Murdoch, all those people. And they are basically drifting in the same direction as all these massive banks and companies, which is we want a super state. We want one place in the whole of Europe that we can go to lobby to get what we want. We don't want to go around 20 different countries, 20 different capitals, uh, because those countries can possibly play us off against each other. We want to control the continent. And that's, I'm afraid, the real reason why all these MPs at the moment are doing everything they can, coming up with any excuse possible to try and delay, delay, delay Brexit and possibly force another referendum. Uh, and and it's, it's absolutely wide open easy for anyone to see the way that Corbyn has backtracked on having a general election to see exactly what they're up to. Yeah, well said, Tony. We'll never leave the European Union. I've been saying it for years. You're you're talking to an Irishman who covered Nice, who covered the Lisbon Treaty. I've been following the European Union and how it operates for, well, for for over 20 years. Tony Gosling is our guest. Thisweek.org.uk. We'll leave Brexit for the moment. However this election scenario plays out, um, we won't be leaving the European Union anytime soon, I don't think. I'm fascinated because I rang you this morning and you said something very interesting to me. Um, Tony, Tony has got a network of 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 um how do I put this of sources and informants around the country. I'm not joking when I say this. People who uh, tip him off to interesting things going on. You mentioned the warmongers on the Labour uh, back benches. Wasn't it disgusting a couple of years ago to hear Hillary Benn beating the drum for war with Syria? That bastard had made me sick. But anyway, we'll leave that alone for now. Let's talk about war because people are telling you about war manoeuvrings and bases in this country and planes. Um, that's... Um, worrying if not wholly surprising tony what are you hearing okay well look, let's just look at the u.s air force um bases and the national security agency bases presence in britain really starting with the north then there's uh filing dales and men with hill both they've gone on the on the outside of these bases it says raf of course they're not raf at all they are uh, nsa and u.s air force um, then, then there's um, RAF Lake and Heath. Actually, just a bit north of that is Warrington. And I was hearing earlier on uh, about the possible presence of Israeli aircraft at Warrington. No, but that is just a rumour. That's just a rumour, and that's from people who live locally. Having sp- and this is basically, you know, who drives all this? It's the good old plane spotters. You know, the nerds right, right, with yeah, their yeah, vacuum, yeah. vacuum flasks, yeah. like the guys that stand writing the numbers of trains down, but instead they're at the runway watching what's landing and what's taking off. And uh, so they're a fascinating source of information. In fact, these people, Richie, bless them, were those that exposed the whole rendition program back sort of eight, ten years ago of uh, these CIA secret flights taking people to secret prisons around the world. So let's, you know, give them a good old pat on the back for sticking those camera lenses into those so-called secret US bases. But anyway, in Norfolk, they've then got Milden Hall and Lakenheath, um, RAF Molesworth over there too. Uh, there's Crowton in the Midlands, Welford, which is on the M4. If any of your listeners uh, drive along the M4, you'll find it. It says works unit only. It's somewhere near Swindon and you can turn off to this massive uh, explosives storing storage base. Well, you probably advise not to turn off there. Yeah. Um, and and the final one, which is near me, is RAF Fairford. Now, these B-2 bombers have definitely been spotted and photographed at Fairford. A uh, small flight of them from the US are over here at the moment. These are the so-called stealth bombers, uh, even though actually the Russians say, well, we can see them on the radar and everyone says we can see them on the radar so they're not actually that stealthy but they were the same aircraft that we used uh, earlier on to bomb 
uh, Syria and have been used to bomb Iraq. And what they do is they actually have a range from the UK where they can fly out from here to bomb the Middle East. So they've been used before. They're now here doing what they've called training. And the reason we know about this is because they've been waking people up in Stroud at three o'clock in the morning as they're flying in over the city or the town. And uh, thankfully, some of the Stroudies I'm in touch with have just been giving me a call saying, look, look, Look at this, Tony. And it's, it's popped up also in Gloucestershire Live uh, in, I think it's, it's not, I'm not sure if it's the Stroud News and Journal. Anyway, lo- one of the local newspapers has been inviting photographs and in getting a tremendous number of photos of these aircraft that have been training, not just in Fairford, which is in Gloucestershire, but also they've also been spotted flying backwards and forwards to Norfolk to Lake and Heath and Milton Hall. So this sounds a bit irregular, Tony. It doesn't sound like a common thing because some, some listeners might think, well, we know the US has got a big presence in the UK in, in army bases. Now, when I say we know, a few of us know, thanks to people like you, we know. You and I used to talk about this during my days on the radio in Spain, funnily enough, about US bases in this country. But I think the vast majority of the public don't really know. So could it be that this is just routine training flights or is it irregular? And if it is irregular, what might be going on? Well, the B-2s definitely are irregular. Uh, I mean, there were some aircraft over here, I think B-52s, uh, a couple of months ago, but they were for a specific exercise. These, they're not saying anything about why they're here, really. Um, but in the past, what we've seen is these kinds of unannounced presence of uh, US B-2 bombers is are before precision strikes. So this is, when I say precision, obviously, you know, they can't be that no. uh, precise. But we're talking about, say, for example, if there's a particular Iranian military facility or Syrian military facility or palace or whatever that they decide they want to hit. Of course, they went for Gaddafi's palace when uh, that conflict was on. These are the sorts of aircraft that they would use for that. So that's the sort of thing I'd expect to actually come out of this in the next maybe weeks or months is some. And of course, what happens once those aircraft are there? Richie, they 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 chug into a little hangar and they just hang around. Uh, so they don't you don't wouldn't necessarily think anything of it until they then come out again, uh, and in maybe a month or two months time and go on a mission. But uh, what I've asked the people down down there to do is to just give me a call if they hear them taking off late at night. And you know what? You will hear them over London. This is the way it works. You can hear them in London unless I suppose they divert down uh, down to the Channel or something. Because I can remember in the bombing of Kosovo, we could hear the Fairford. Uh, aircraft t- uh, that had taken off flying over the top of London. They sound completely different to the normal uh, sort of, you know, la- aircraft will be landing at Heathrow Airliners, that sort of thing. They're much higher and there's a much deeper tone. But that's, uh, I'm afraid, we are just Airstrip One, aren't we? Simple as that. And while you're talking about that, a great friend of ours, uh, the, the programme, Jean Anne Crowley, the Irish actress and journalist. Jean Anne says, and it's sad to, to have to agree with her that the the US military uses Shannon Airport like a bus stop. It's there all the time. And well, you know that's right. And that's that's mainly used for troops. I think what happens troops, is yeah. they come from the US and they're basically they're they're like kind of airliners really. Uh, and they're full up with soldiers and as they're rotated in places like like Afghanistan or the Middle East, so you know, one tour of duty duty, the soldiers will get on the plane and a whole bunch will get off uh, fresh from the US from you know uh, and that and that's what Shannon is used for mainly. We um we know that everything the the the, the US mainstream me excuse me the uk mainstream media is focused almost exclusively on the brexit nonsense at the moment but you and i know because we look at the news wires from other countries particularly countries in the middle east that the situation in the strait of hormuz is very very tense at the moment you've got um uk naval vessels and us naval vessels right on the edge of iranian waters uh, escorting ships there uh, it's 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 incredibly tense there. We know that the Israeli government is desperate to launch um, strikes against um, inside Iran. How do you you know? I've, I talked to. Well, you. I mean, okay. So what Israel's been doing over the last week? Yeah, what's so happening is, there? It's amazing, isn't it? To yeah. see attacks on Lebanon. Attacks, Lebanon. I mean, this is airstrikes from Israel. Some drone strikes. Some from uh, from military aircraft. In Lebanon, in Syria and in Iraq, the Israelis seem to think they can just hit whoever they want. And and what they're trying to say is that these are all 
preparations by Iran to attack Israel from these various countries. Well, there's no evidence for that whatsoever, of course. And uh, so the uh, idea really, I think, here is to just try to provoke the Iranians to, into something. The Iranians are not like that. They're not going to be provoked. I think that's pretty certain, although uh, we've seen um, from Nasrallah in, over in Lebanon that they are, they are now hitting across the border. They've, decided, they've said that they are now hitting, um, they, anyway, one <laughs> Israeli vehicle. The Israelis have denied this. They said, oh, they didn't hit anything. Although if you look at the footage that the Lebanese have released, it does look as if they've destroyed an armored personnel carrier. I think the Israeli, the only excuse I can imagine for the Israelis is that this was a remote controlled uh, armored personnel carrier uh, with nobody in it. Yeah. Uh, that's the only explanation I can have, or else the Israelis are just lying. Yeah, and, the, and the, the Western media, of course, reports what it is told by the IDF. Obviously, it doesn't do any investigation of its own. Here's a very interesting story, which I know you will be aware of. Some of our listeners Listeners won't be aware of uh, the BBC and other. I, mean, I think we might have just lost Tony there, did we? Momentarily, he might have just dropped. That, that sounds like you've lost somebody, doesn't it? That. Let's take it. There he is now, ringing me back. Look, I've got to mute those bloody noises. Tony, thanks. We lost you momentarily. I was just going to ask you about a story that the BBC has covered this morning, and uh, I think it was in the Telegraph as well. Uh, and that is the UK, the United States, France, and and Iran. Amazingly may be complicit in war crimes in Yemen over their support for various parties in the conflict there, according to, uh, as I said, the United Nations. How much stock do you put in that story? Western powers may be held accountable for what they've done in Yemen, of course, by what they've done, the UK, of course, and the United States, uh, sending Saudi Arabia uh, weapons of death and destruction, which have been used to murder innocent people in Yemen. What do you think of that, United Nations? Well, uh, okay, okay, so this is something which may change under this new government, under Boris. It's entirely possible, because I think the foreign, foreign, as I understand, the Foreign Commonwealth Office have been putting quite a lot of pressure on the politicians over the last few years, saying, look, ease off, ease off, ease off, because this support for Saudi Arabia could blow back in our face. Uh, and also ease off Iran, because this pressure the Americans are putting on us is putting us in the firing line, which we don't want to be. And it may well be that the new government under Boris uh, may go along with that a little bit more, that Foreign, foreign Commonwealth Office advice. Um, and that actually, you know, this is one of the things that it's almost it's impossible since it, the new government has only just come in. But remember, the uh, tanker seizure over in Gibraltar was Jeremy Hunt's work. So he's the kind of the old guard. He's the former foreign secretary uh, under the May government. And this really was a bankster government under May. Um, and so I think we've got a bit of a new, I mean, I'm not holding out my hopes massively, but 14 billion of new spending is going to make an enormous difference to you know teachers and all that sort of thing to you know police firemen all this all the public servants that we've got it's going to make a massive difference and i think in foreign policy we might see a reflection of that with a little bit more of a sensible approach which is more in line with the foreign commonwealth office advice um that we've been seeing and also of course this means a potential change in attitude to Israel to a certain extent. I mean, we've seen obviously Priti Patel taking over at the Home Office, which is horrendous. I mean, although th I mean that means really that the Israelis have got a, a, a link straight into British domestic policy. As if they needed uh, any more, now, let's be honest. The criminal justice system here. But the rest yeah. of the government does seem as if it may take a bit of a different attitude to Trump and his pro-Israeli, you know, pro-Jerusalem being the capital, anti-Iranian attitude. And uh, so there may be a bit of common sense kicking in with this new government, Richie. I hope you're right, but I don't agree with you. Uh, and when I say that, no, and when I say that, I say that with the utmost respect because I have enormous respect for your reasoning and you're very often right, but I, I don't see it. Israel is... Well, I just have a different feel with these people. With, with Sajid Javid and Boris, I think you've got almost human beings out there who are not totally controlled. Obviously, it takes a while for, this, for the uh, dark forces within the civil service and the big corporate lobbyists and the banksters to blackmail our politicians when they're office into doing what they want so we're bound to get a bit of a feel of that but i think we may be i may have something a bit genuine here look with boris particularly with I I iran remember he revealed that nazanin zaghari ravkilif who the iranians have got in custody actually was over there uh, as a journalist now he wasn't supposed to say that but it's the truth 
And, uh, you know, that's the reason why she shouldn't have been. I mean, that basically, the stuff we've been being spun through the press was nonsense about her just being over there touring, you know. No, oh, yeah. she was doing yeah, yeah, journalist yeah. training. And that's why the Israelis, uh, sorry, the, the Iranians nabbed her because they believed that she was doing spying as part of that and that she was trying to subvert the journalistic process in, uh, over in, 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 in Iran. So by Boris coming out with that, that does say something a little bit about there may be different factions in the Foreign Office and some of them egging him on uh, when he was foreign secretary to say some of the to actually tell the truth. Uh, and so this is a positive thing. But of course, there's always the pressure, as there has been on Trump over the last four or five, uh, three or four years, to steer away from what he originally committed to. So, you know, I think we just need to hold our politicians up sometimes, particularly when we've got a new broom in and say, look, guys, come on, let's just get on with it. And I'd love to see him, of course, leave on leave the EU <laughs> on the 29th of October. Uh, it looks like it's a bit of a tall order, though. Well, do you know, as we're, as we're speaking, the bill against no deal has passed uh, the first Commons vote. So this is breaking. I hate to say breaking news. It's very MSM crap, but this is this is news. It's just happening. Uh, three hundred and twenty-nine yeah, for three hundred against. Do to stop this? Yeah. So there may be little tricks that he's got up his sleeve, cards up his sleeve, or whatever you know, to 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 kick this into the long grass. Because I think that you know they're determined to leave. Um, whether or not that will happen, it may be a general election. Who knows? He's in, yeah, Tony, hang on, hang on a second. Hang on. Hang on a second. to talk about Hong Kong a bit as well. I know. Let's do is... that. We've got 10 minutes left on this, maybe 12 okay. or 13 if you want. But before we do talk about Hong Kong, because it is very important, because I'm very intrigued by it, um, a lot of reporters are saying that Johnson is in serious trouble here because more Tory backbenchers have basically rebelled uh, against him and gone with the Ramoners. Uh, like I said, it's 329 uh, to uh, three. A uh, hundred. Um, this is pretty devastating, really. They're 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 taking no deal out of his hands completely. They're now shortly going to vote to force him to ask the European Union to extend um, the whole process till January thirty first. Meaning he wouldn't leave on October thirty first. It's a kind of a shit show, if I can be so crass. And while I get such a lot of my predictions wrong, I've I've called this one to the letter in terms of this is how the European Union would win the day and prevent us ever leaving. But look, we, we, that's splitting hairs. I know we're going to talk about this again in the very near future. You're right that Hong Kong is phenomenally interesting. Carrie Lam, the chief executive, uh, earlier today, uh, because of course it's later in the evening there, uh, seemingly has given the protesters what they wanted and agreed to take this um, extradition uh, uh, bill, this extradition plan uh, uh, away to basically to, to, to bin it, uh, seemingly given the protest, protesters what uh, they've wanted. We've had weeks of these protests, uh, seemingly barbaric treatment uh, by the police there against the protesters, the protests growing and growing in number. I'm always very suspicious when I see these street protests, Tony, because I'm... Um, you know, I think of Arab Spring, I think of the people behind those types of protests. How have you read yeah. this whole thing? What's going okay. on there? Well, I mean, I spent a couple of weeks in Hong Kong about two years ago, um, and I visited the, uh, in fact, interviewed several journalists at, at the uh, Foreign Press Bureau there. It's actually, well, it's a Foreign Press Club. And the sense there was very much a sort of siege mentality. You know, we're going to stick to the way we do things. The Chinese are going to try and bully us. And it wasn't just the press. This was people I spoke to in the street as well. Ordinary people are very much aware that they've got a, uh, a very authoritarian state on their doorstep, uh, which is what China is, extremely authoritarian. Um, and I don't, I mean, I... I, I do. I take what you say when you see these big movements out on the street. You know, is this being Soros funded or MI6 funded or whatever? But there's a gen. I mean, when you get a million people out, it's it's quite genuine fears yeah, that the Hong yeah. Kong people have about being run from Beijing. They really don't want it. I mean, just look for example at some of the. Um, I think it's Hansan, that's one of the cities which is the most polluted on earth. It's a horrendous place to live and work. The kids grow up choking. You know, there's also the uh, the um, effect, effect on those in the west of the country, um, the Uyghurs who are being put into these kind of re-education camps uh, by the million. You know, so the Chinese government is not something to dice with. And I think what's happened here is it's really simple. In my view, They've the, the Chinese, Beijing have been looking at this. They've been getting very threatening. They've been saying, in fact, last week, the end of last week, they said, we are going to arrest 
every, anyone that comes out to protest at the weekend. We're banning these demonstrations. So the official people who run the demonstrations said, OK, no demonstrations this weekend because that keeps them in the clear. But what happened? Nearly half a million people came out anyway to demonstrate. And to me, this sent a very, very clear message to Beijing that whatever they do, whatever they say, these protests are going to continue. Um, and of course, there's a very reasonable, uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole precedent to this, by the way, which many people don't realise, which is when I was there, they were talking about the booksellers and the bookshop people who were being kidnapped effectively by the Chinese state and hidden away from their families for years. These are people who are selling um, expose books who are exp which are exposing things like the private life and the uh, blackmail of uh, President Xi, you know, the fact that he's not exactly squeaky clean. And these books were only on sale in Hong Kong. You couldn't get them in China. And the Chinese authorities uh, kidnapped various, uh, arrested secretly without telling the families and kept them in jail for long periods of time without explaining anything about why they got them, the owners and the managers of this bookshop in Hong Kong. So this is one of the things that the Hong Kong people do want to be able to do, sort of just basically write things and publish them. This is effectively what this is all about. They're not allowed to criticise President Xi, apparently. They can be arrested for that, for laughing during the National Anthem. Yeah, you can yeah. be arrested for that in China. And Hong Kong is saying, we're not going down that road. We're definitely not going down there. By the way, the demands, only one of them has been met, but I mean, it's the main one, really. The main one, The demands, yeah. I think, are five main demands, which is one is they want the bill to be withdrawn, which has been announced today, which is fantastic news. Uh, also for Carrie Lam to step down. Well, maybe that demand might go now she's done what they've asked. Who knows? Uh, also an inquiry into pr police brutality, which may well happen anyway. And for those who have been arrested to be released. And finally, uh, this is those who have been arrested for non-violent offences to be released um, and um, for greater democratic freedoms. And that's the bottom line, isn't it? What they want is some kind of democracy. The sort of democracy, by the way, which the British actually never gave them. But they're now saying, well, we want it, which is fair enough. Uh, and I, I think that even though it's a, a real David and Goliath struggle, actually. And actually, the many people in China, ordinary people in China, are watching what's going on in Hong Kong very closely because they can remember Tiananmen Square and they can remember their own pro democracy movements uh, from 20, 30 years ago. And they're thinking, well, actually, we rather admire the ability of the people of Hong Kong to get together and come out on the streets. And I think you're right. You know, there's a certain amount of MI6 probably uh, egging this along. It's so incredibly well organized. This, for example, the, the airport protest was brilliantly organised, where they didn't actually stop anybody coming off the planes or getting to their planes or anything, didn't interrupt people checking in. They were just there singing and chanting and handing out leaflets. So as soon as anybody comes into the country, they're immediately confronted by the fact that there's a mass movement here. Something very interesting and important is going on. Yeah, I think that's outstanding analysis, Tony. It is lazy of uh, for people, including myself, to think that there's Western influence there. You've outlined brilliantly why people Well, I think there is a bit, terrified. you know, I think MI, I'd be, MI6 wouldn't be doing their job if they weren't giving a little bit of a hand a little to the protesters. A, push to it. a little bit of a push to it. Yeah, but you did describe exactly what life is like for uh, Christians, the Falun Gong, uh, Chinese dissenters. You know, we, because of, when I say we, I, I speak for myself, because of my opinion of this country, because of my opinion of Israel, because of my opinion of the United States, it's easy to side with Russia and China and, you know, to claim that they're the benign victim in geopolitical events. But it's not the case. Russia is not the greatest place to be if you've got certain points of view. Uh, we know all about China's human rights record. I spent years as an activist, uh, act, you know, campaigning against capital punishment in every country in the world. It can be a dreadful uh, regime, authoritarian is authoritarian as you described it so it's excellent analysis mate I think the protests are genuine and um, you, you're, you're right to make the point that that maybe um, dark actors see those protests and think well we can push them along because we have our own agenda read China it's um, you know you're absolutely spot so on incredibly well organised I've never seen anything quite like it the way that they you know the the, the sites of the protests keep changing that the leaders of the protests are totally invisible that the leaders say oh we, we want everyone not to go to the protest this weekend but half a million people turn up anyway I mean it just seems spectacularly well organised and in fact maybe a model uh, for getting social change in any other kind of uh, authoritarian regime absolutely brilliant Folks, you can hear Tony Gosling at, on The Politics Show 
on BCFM. It's uh, thisweek.org.uk to find out all about it. It's a weekly programme. It's outstanding. It really is. I listen to it all the time. I don't miss an episode of it. Uh, thanks for your help today, uh, mate, coming on to talk about that Brexit, of course, the US military presence here and movements uh, ongoing in, in this country on those bases and, of course, that analysis of Hong Kong. I look forward to speaking to you again soon and thanks for sticking up for free speech a couple of weeks ago when... Uh, yours truly was being called anti-Semitic just because I happen to have people on the programme from time to time. Uh, well, look, Richie, I've got to congratulate you, know. you before we say goodbye on your prediction of uh, Epstein hanging himself. I mean, it's an absolutely pre- precise bit of prediction. And, of course, the amazing thing in the in the roll-up after that is that Ghislaine Maxwell has not been arrested. No. I mean, she's clearly involved in this. In fact, possibly even a, a main player in this uh, ch- uh, child sex trafficking, which has been going on for around about 20 years, involving all sorts of key people. Um, and so, yet she still walks the street. So it just shows what a joke the US criminal justice system is, and I suppose the British as, as well, since apparently she comes to London quite a bit. So she is the one that should be uh, given a citizen's arrest or uh, certainly her collar should be felt and she should definitely uh, you know, go to trial and all this stuff would come out because of course that's why Epstein uh, was almost certainly suicided in jail is because of the incredible testimony he would have been able to come out with with some of the most rich and powerful people in the western world and he would have potentially brought them down. Do you know, that, that segues brilliantly into my second hour because I'll be speaking to a guest and we will be focusing on that. I know you're going to be spending a bit of time on Gillian Maxwell as well. I'm sure yeah. we'll talk about that in the near future. Thanks again, Tony. I really appreciate it, mate. Thanks for your help. Um, you honour me by coming on. Tony Gosling there, the host of The Politics Show on BCFM in Bristol, thisweek.org.uk. Cheers, Tony. Uh, top man there. I want to say hi to Phil Restino as well in Florida. How you doing, Phil? who, like myself, is a big fan of Bob Seger, uh, the album Night Moves 1976, which I have a beautiful copy on vinyl. I've got a first pressing of that on vinyl, would you believe? Uh, Phil, and I love it. Uh, Phil's also sent me an email about uh, about this programme and Phil's thoughts uh, on the programme and on me, and he wants me to read it out, but I'm not going to, Phil. It's a lovely, kind uh, critique of the programme. It's lovely. You say some very nice things about me. I don't want to read it out because it's going to sound like I'm sending myself flowers. But uh, thanks, mate. It means a lot to me that you would uh, think uh, so highly of the radio programme. I really appreciate that. It's uh, two minutes past the hour, by the way. This is the Richie Allen Show, live on Fab Radio 2 here in uh, Seoul, uh, here in Greater Manchester. The programme is live from Salford, of course, uh, the great city of Salford. And uh, thanks to Tony. Uh, Charlie Robinson, the author of The Octopus of Global Control, will join the programme in a few minutes' time. Uh, Charlie's in Denver, I believe. Uh, brilliant interview with Charlie a year and a half or so ago. And I know that he's all over the Jeffrey Epstein story and he's got some very interesting thoughts on it, as well as uh, thoughts on uh, other things as well. So we'll get Charlie on the programme in a few minutes' time. In the meantime, let's have more music. And there's a theme running through the songs today. This is the Eagles. I just love the sound of Southern California. A tune called Lying Eyes, or Lion Eyes even, on your Richie Allen show. Back in a few minutes with much more and your comments as well. Eagles, you're not allowed to say the Eagles. You're not supposed to say the Eagles. It's Eagles on the Richie Allen show and Lion Eyes. It's all kicking off at Westminster in the last uh, 15 minutes or thereabouts. Remain MPs, the opposition parties, have won the first vote of two. Well, there'll be three in in, in total this evening, but they have uh, won the vote. They have secured uh, the vote that takes no deal off the table. Boris Johnson now is not allowed uh, to leave the European Union with no deal on October 31st. They're now debating and will vote uh, a little bit later on on um, an extension. Namely, if they win that vote, Johnson will have to ask the European Union for an extension beyond October 31st. Uh, don't say I didn't told, I didn't tell you so. Right, let's welcome my uh, next guest back to the programme. Um, I'm really happy he's uh, agreed to come back on. We had a fantastic conversation uh, just over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, about his brilliant book. And it is brilliant. It's very, very funny in places. Uh, very witty, but very, very serious. I'm talking, of course, about the octopus of global control 
and it's a book you can find on Amazon and I do recommend you check it out it's brilliant um, when he was on with me we talked about his own journey how he worked in the mortgage industry and how while working in the mortgage industry and bearing witness to massive fraud and corruption uh, he began to read and he began to investigate the wider world and in fact I do remember we talked about John Perkins at the time who was an old friend of mine and John's book Confessions of an Economic Hitman anyway his own book as I said The Octopus of Global Control is terrific check it out uh, online and buy it if you haven't uh, read it before I'm delighted that Charlie Robinson has agreed to come back on the programme today uh, to talk about some very topical things Charlie welcome back how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Wait a second. We can't call it the Eagles? No, you're supposed to say Eagles, apparently, because I was at Eagles in Manchester very recently, and we were arguing in the front row about this. Is it the Eagles or Eagles? Apparently it's the Eagles. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway. I stand corrected. Hey, some I, of the, so do the, I. Some of the greatest music of all time. I, you know, you, in a concert I've never, I've never gone to see, which I will regret at some point in my life for sure. Well, you know what, Charlie? When, when going to see them, and I've loved them my entire life, it was obviously Glenn... Frey and Timothy B. Schmidt and it was obviously Joe Walsh of course but of course Glenn Frey died a few years ago and uh, that's a tragedy so you're kind of seeing the Eagles or Eagles and uh, Glenn Frey's son and one or two extra musicians but anyway it was a great night anyway listen since you wrote the book um, it's been stratospheric stuff for you loved you um, on Renegade on RT by the way and you've done so much other stuff no terrific stuff mate you're getting the word out there to people in a lovely way too in a very inclusive way, in a way that people are, in a way that people are likely to listen to, you know, you're not a ranter, you're not a screamer, you're a funny man, and you say to people, "Look, this is what I've come across." Um, your manner, your demeanour, I think, is huge, a huge part of your success. And congratulations on it, Charlie. And the book, man, the book is fantastic. It really is. Oh, thank you. Well, let me. T- I'll just say this: that I'm not a ranter, <clears throat> only because I learned through trial and error that it doesn't work very well. You know, I had those Thanksgiving dinner conversations where you bring up 9-11 and the entire table turns on you and you start trying to lecture them and say, this is how it went down and this is what happened. And I found that people don't like that. They don't like that approach. They don't like people telling them. I have found that it's probably a better way to say to someone, hey, uh, maybe you could help me understand this. Uh, Maybe you could help me understand how a a 47-story steel frame building came down and free fall speed symmetrical in the, on the afternoon of 9-11. I'm having a hard time understanding that, which of course is a lie. You understand perfectly well that it didn't come down under natural causes. But if you phrase it in a way like that, it seems to be a little bit, a little bit easier to digest. And then, you know, my, my, uh, when I wrote the book, part of it was, you know, as you're writing these, you're writing about these topics, topics that you cover have been covering for, for years and years, you know, we have to admit they're a bit dark. And part of the the way I felt that it was easier to get the point across was to do it with a little bit of humor. I'd always liked the way Jon Stewart on The Daily Show did it in the U.S. for years and years. He would he would take some ridiculous story and he would make fun of it and you'd wind up laughing at it, something very serious. You'd you'd laugh at yeah. it, but at the same time, you'd <laughs> understand, oh, this is a real story. This is a serious – so it got it got the point across. I thought it, it was a nice way to deliver some some potentially uh, dark news or some some bad news that way. And, and, and yeah, and since we have spoke last, I, I, um, I went to an Acapulco in Mexico. I was able to uh, uh, to meet – a lot of great people hear a lot of them speak. I sat in the front row for David Icke for four hours and listened to his talk. I heard Ron Paul, Max Egan was there, uh, Benny Wills from Joy Camp, and um, you know, just a, a ton of a ton of people. It was kind of like the uh, it's kind of like the Super Bowl of the alternative media, and uh, everyone seems to either be there as a guest, uh, as a speaker, or or there to to witness the events. And your friend and mine, uh, Jeff Berwick, of course, is the owner of Anarchapulco. He's the Great creator guy. of Anarchapulco. Great guy, Jeff, yeah. Great guy. Well, Jeff and I have a book coming out pretty soon that we've written together. So once that's out, I'll make sure you get a copy of it. And, and probably maybe both of us will come back on and we'll, Lovely. we'll chat that a little sounds, bit about that it. That sounds brilliant, mate. Yeah, I look forward to that. Well, maybe before we finish, you might give us an indication as to what the book is going to be uh, about. Charlie Robinson is 
is our guest. The Octopus of Global Control is an unmissable read. And it's, it, it's not... A, to say that it's entry level might sound like an insult to Charlie. I don't mean it's yeah. entry level, but I mean for that willfully obstinate person who doesn't want to, to, to consider these issues, um, it's so funny, it's so satirical. Um, it is a, a lovely read to give to somebody, to get them thinking about it. It's genius. It's a, it's a terrific book. And, no, um, not an insult at all. In fact, I would say I, I would I would agree with you 100%. It's a great it's compliment. You, yeah, it's a book that you give to people. Like if you've gone down this path with your friends and family and they're looking at you like, you know, you're, you seem like you might be you're a little mad. bit of a crazy person, <laughs> you know, then you say, well, you've gone as far as you can. Send them the book because the fact that there's 50 different topics in there, there's got, there's bound to be one that will connect with a person and they'll read that and they'll say, oh my God, I never knew this. If this yeah. is a lie, what else is a lie? And then it starts them, you know, it starts, every one of us has gone down this path. It's that chain reaction where you find one lie that just doesn't sit well with you and you discover it and then you look for another one and another and another and that leads you to where it leads you to where we are now which is we're questioning everything which is a good thing and you know for in my particular case it was you know it was 911 i think it was that way for a lot of people i think the people that r- ran that operation overplayed their hand and they accidentally woke up more people than um than they thought they would and so but from there then you learn about something else and and maybe maybe if you're an older american your trigger is Vietnam, right? You, your your uncle went to Vietnam and, you know, a lot of people died there and you find out that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was not as it was portrayed and that it was a, there was never really an attack there and that that was the pretext for Vietnam and you start to scratch your head and go, God, if wow. they lied yeah. to us about Vietnam, did they lie to us about the Gulf Wars? Yeah, of course they did. Did they lie? Are they lying to us about Iran? the coming war are they lying to us about venezuela yes you're starting to get you start to get the context of what's going on and so yeah it's a it's a and then charlie and then you start to try to figure out what or who they is which you do brilliantly in the book what is they when we say they were responsible for vietnam they were responsible for supporting the nazis they were responsible for the lies about the japanese uh during the second world war who are they charlie look today is wednesday next week and i'm sure you'll be marking it next week will be 18 years since September 11th happened. It's a real red letter day for me because I was on air in a real commercial radio station with a huge audience describing it as it was happening uh, to our audience. I'll never forget it. It it was an amazing thing uh, to be talking about. It was horrific. It was thrilling at the same time as a competitive journalist and a competitive radio station. So it was very important for you, very important for me in coming to terms with the lies and the deceptions of our media and of our governments. I'm I'm pessimistic though. You know, next week we we're 18 years since it happened, Charlie. You said yeah. that they overplayed their hand. I, I like to hear that because I like to be positive about it. But at the same time, I see September the 11th getting to be like um, November 22nd, 1963. We go further and further away from it, and I and I wonder, you know, are we missing? the boat, as it were, with that massive event, you know, can we do more with it in terms of raising awareness about the the global cabal? Well, we can, of course. And I think some of the one group that has been instrumental in in raising awareness around the country, around the United States, I think internationally as well, is a group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And that's led by uh, Richard Gage. He they just released a document today showing that they um, they they partnered with a with the University of Alaska Fairbanks in releasing a, a draft. Of, it took four years. It was a computer modeling study of World Trade Center 7's collapse that was conducted by these researchers at the university's um, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And what they found, no surprise to any of us, was that the collapse of World Trade Center 7 on 9-11 was not caused by fire, but rather by a near simultaneous failure of every column in the building, which – I think we all understand is an impossibility unless that building was wired for demolition. This is groundbreaking, well, Charlie. This and thanks for sharing this with me because I wouldn't have known this. Now I've known Richard for years, but he's not been on the program for a while. I must give him a ring and get him back on. Thanks for bringing this up. This is vital information that most of my listeners will not know. Uh, 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 an academic institution, a university, a credible one, an establishment one in Alaska yeah. has partnered with the architects and engineers, all of whom are qualified to say that. Fire couldn't have brought down uh, Building Seven. This is massive news. Yeah, massive. Yeah, and 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 you're not an architect. Neither am I. We're not engineers. 
but did you really need to be to understand that that building came down in an unnatural manner? I mean, it, I, I lived in Las Vegas for a long, long time, and they would televise that when they were imploding these uh, old hotels in order to make way yeah. for a new one. They would, they would, in typical Vegas style, they didn't just blow them up. They set fireworks off and everything, so they made a big show about it. But you would put those side by side with, with Building 7. And, you know, it was obvious that it came down at, at, in a controlled demolition. But what was interesting and what I thought was was brilliant uh, and someone like me that has a marketing background, I loved what architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth did a couple years ago. They they took a bunch of uh, uh, billboards, mobile billboards and stationary billboards in New York City, and they just ran the the tagline, did you know that a third building fell on 9-11? Very Fantastic. simple, you know, right to the point. But so many people don't realize that. And we talked about this just a little bit earlier. You never know what the one thing is going to be that starts somebody down this rabbit hole, right? So maybe it's a question as simple as that. Did you know the third building fell? Now, if you didn't know and you see that billboard, you would go, what are they talking about? And it yeah. says AE 9-11 truth, you know, dot org or whatever, whatever their website is. You might look at it or you might ask someone, what is this billboard about? And they say, oh, yeah, well there was a third building that fell. I never heard that. You never heard that? So you think you know the story of 9-11, but you didn't know that a third building fell? Maybe you don't know the full story of 9-11. So it's genius the way they did that. It wasn't confrontational. It was just a simple question. And if you know the answer, yeah, of course a third building fell, then you probably know that 9-11 is not as it seems. But for people that are waking up to this, which seems kind of impossible to to the people in the alternative media community. We're like, well, where have you been for the last 18 years to not be awake to this? But we have to acknowledge there are a lot of people that still just don't realize it for whatever reason. Either they don't care, they're working three jobs, and they don't have time to, to get into this or or whatever. But when they have that, that one simple question, they start to dig into it, and they realize, well, I did not know that a third building fell. Well, why wasn't it in the media? Why wasn't that? I mean, I've seen the two, the two buildings fall – a thousand, a thousand times, times on my times, nightly yeah. news. Why yeah. haven't I seen building the third building? Because it wasn't hit by a plane and it doesn't conform, it doesn't fit with the official narrative, right? Uh, so, and you know what, so Charlie? They, some hit of, they hit it. And some of us in this part of the world watched the BBC report live, which which these days is hysterically funny. Um, yeah. It wasn't funny at the time. You know, people lost their lives. That's not funny. But now we look back and we see the woman standing in front of Building 7, talking about it having collapsed when in fact it was still standing. There is no earthly explanation for it. There is no ethical explanation. There is no journalistic explanation for that at all. And I've been a journalist for many years. Uh, unless you were told that the building was going to be brought down or would be brought down in a few minutes or whatever. It's an absolute scandal. And on that, and um, because of... We're, we're 23 minutes more or less past the hour now. We're going to go... Uh, till about 10 minutes to the top of the hour or thereabouts. Uh, we could talk all day on September the 11th and you'd never um, you'd never bore us and, and, and I'd love to talk all day about it. But because you mentioned how important it was and the establishment or whoever was behind it overplaying their hand back in 2001, we talk about things that seem to, to gain momentum and wake people up to use that term, the Epstein thing, Charlie. Yes. That's definitely, oh that's catching people. And I know you've done an awful lot on this and you've been researching this, you've been watching it, you've been investigating, you've been listening to people talking about it. We're talking, of course, about the billionaire uh, Jeffrey Epstein, who was found dead a couple of weeks ago in his cell in in New York City. He was um, basically being held, as we would say, on remand, uh, pending, uh, uh, pending trial. He was refused bail. He was on watch. He was supposed to be taken care of. Um, wow. A friend of the rich and powerful, friend of very powerful politicians, friend of royal family members, Jeffrey Epstein. I wonder uh, his demise and all the unanswered questions, uh, is that maybe overplaying uh, the hand, m you know, maybe the establishment? And is that going to maybe alert more and more people as to something is very rotten at the heart of our government and at the heart of our establishment? What do you think, Charlie? Oh, of course. I mean, this is the one thing that uh, Caitlin Johnstone wrote an article that said now everybody's a conspiracy theorist. And she's right, because because when you come out with this story about how a guy hangs himself in his jail cell where he's not where, where he's prevented from hanging himself. And you talk about room, you know, having a cellmate being moved out. Talk about Attorney General Barr making a visit there a couple of days earlier, or changing his will two days earlier. And then he magically hangs himself. I mean, 
even the most, uh, you know, in the box thinking person looks at that and goes, that story doesn't add up. No. That story does not add up at all. And I would encourage people if they're, if they're interested in digging into the depths of this to go check out mint press news and the four part series that Whitney Webb has done on this. She is amazing. The ties be- of this man go beyond anything we could imagine. We're not, I'm not just talking about child trafficking and money laundering and the things that he was accused of. But this goes back to the Iran Contra, to the BCCI bank, the bank for crooks and criminals international that George HW Bush was involved in and Ollie North and all these guys that were running, uh, drugs and, and weapons for the Contras and, and selling oil, uh, you know, Iranian oil and all of this. Um, Epstein has ties to that as well. Les Wexner, the, you know, sweet old billionaire that sells ladies underwear. Well, guess what? That guy is mobbed up big time with the uh, Jewish mafia and he has uh, drug running connections, money laundering connections. And this is the guy that got Epstein his start. So, yeah, they might have overplayed their hand on this. There's a lot of people looking into it right now. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's all there's enough room on the bandwagon for anyone. Any more of conspiracy theorists that are just waking up that want to jump on, there's plenty of room for you. Welcome to our world, right? Now you're starting to see the world through our eyes, which is, hey, the mainstream media is lying to us. What a you know, for a lot of people, this is like it is news to a lot of news. people. It it's is news to them. Yeah, it is, Charlie. It is. It is. It's, it does stagger me sometimes. It is. It's amazing. You know, I, I'm I'm getting emails from people now going, um, people I've never heard from. And they're saying, um, I, I do find it quite surprising that a man who was considered a high suicide risk was not, you know, w- 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 would have been, would have had access to something that he could have used to hang himself. Surely he would have had uh, laceless loafers or, mm-hmm. I don't know, slip-on shoes. Surely he would have had the guards there. But Charlie, the news that the video security cameras were, were, were malfunctioning in that particular part of the building. It's a question of pull the other one, you know, and it's great to see so many people saying, ah, come on now. And it's great to see so many people wondering, well, what's going to happen with Ghislaine Maxwell? What's going to happen with Prince Andrew? That's a kind of a rhetorical question for you. Um, <laughs> it's good to see the British press won't leave the Prince Andrew thing die. That's very good, that. You know, we criticise the mainstream media a lot, justifiably. But here, the tabloid media just won't let it go, Charlie, about Prince Andrew. That's good. I love that. Yeah, that might be, I mean, obviously it won't go anywhere in the court system, but it is nice to at least have some public shaming going on. And and what, what, what do people, what do we find? What do we know about this? We know that once again, the royal family has been tied to sex trafficking of underage people or pedophilia and things like that. How many does this make? all of them i mean i've i've lost count we've got mount batten and all you know all these things that that david ike has been talking about for years and years waking me up to this and and as an american i didn't really know too much about the british politics um uh, but but as i start to learn more and as i would hear about jimmy savile and this, edward and heath start to, edward heath and you and yeah. you know and, and and all these all these dirty dealings and you find out that he was compromised and he was being blackmailed and bl- this and that and you realize well this is just the newest version of it right well, here's they, a question they, for they, you charlie sorry to interrupt you here's yeah. the question for you oh, i was dying to ask you this charlie robinson is our guest by the way the octopus of global control is an unmissable book check it out charlie's on facebook and he's on twitter uh facebook.com forward slash the octopus of global uh, control get in touch with charlie um, get involved in the debates. Um, I'm in Facebook jail for the next couple. Oh, are next, you? For what? What did you do yeah. now? Oh, you know, I posted something in 2017. They retroactively oh, went back and banned me for a month for it. So if I don't respond to you on Facebook, don't take it personally, people. I will get back to you as soon as my ban is lifted. That's ridiculous. But anyway, it's <laughs> not going to stop you reaching people. Charlie, here's yeah. the question. So all of these heads of state, um, let's forget the royal families for the moment. So you've got all of these heads of state uh, very, very connected politicians, politicians who might not always be prime ministers, but they have other cabinet positions of note. So many of them. Here's my, this is a very rhetorical question. I wonder, are, does the paedophilia come later or does, or, or, or does the establishment seek out these people and bring them into the fold because of their predilection for abusing uh, boys and girls? Are, are they basically groomed and brought into politics because they have, you know, p- proven uh, to be uh, pederasts and yeah. uh, defilers of children. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think it's that. It's the exact opposite of any normal job interview you would consider, right? If you went into it for a job interview and they found out, they said, well, we did a little digging and we, you know, and they, they discovered that you were a pedophile. Obviously you would not get the job. Oh, but not in politics. You see, they actively want those people, scumbags, liars, alcoholics, drug addicts, uh, people cheating on their wives, closeted homosexuals and pedophiles. These are the, these are, these are, the requirements that they are looking for. People look at government and they go, why is it that these people are so screwed up? They do the dumbest things. They get caught in ridiculous situations. They all seem to be such screw ups. Well, the answer is that that's by design. Either you go along with the plan or they force you to go along with the plan. And if it's, if they have, you know, it used to be in the old days, they would get, you know, they'd have some guy that was, uh, you know, like you know, cheat on his wife, or maybe he was a closeted homosexual, they'd find out that information, they'd use it as leverage. Well, at some point you divorce your wife or you come out of the closet and that doesn't work anymore. But if you're a pedophile, they've got you forever. And if you happen to be a high ranking person, if you happen to be, you know, Ted Heath, let's say, and the German, uh, intelligence discovers that you're a closeted yeah, yeah. pedophile. Well then guess what? Now they become prime minister. So it's much easier to do it that way. And so, you know, you get a lot of these people that are just defective human beings that want to go into politics anyway, right? They're, they're sociopaths. And, and I've always said this about like, you know, here in the United States, we have the boy scouts and there's a big thing where all the boy scout troop leaders were getting busted for being pedophiles, not all of them, but, but a, a disproportionate number of them. And people would say, God, what is it about being a boy scout leader that makes you a pedophile? It's not that it's the, it's backwards. It's when you're a pedophile, you go where the hunting is good, right? You go into positions of power over children. You go, you become the gymnastics coach for the, for the, for the kids, uh, you know, of uh, course you do. And Charlie, here's the, here's, like here's the $64 million like dollar question then. At this point, they've been brought in, so they recruit them in the public schools. Now, in England, the public school is a school, we say public schools, and people in the United States think that it's a public school for for everybody. No, a public school means a school where fees are paid. I think they recruit in the public schools, I think they recruit in the boarding schools, and they find the sadistic uh, kids, the sick children, and they get them into, uh, you know, um, political clubs and politics clubs and all of that. And they prey on this. And maybe when these people get into their early 20s, when they're at uni, university, whatever, maybe then, now this is all complete wild speculation. I'd be interested in your opinion. Maybe then Jeffrey Epstein comes in or somebody like him because these young men and women are then brought to parties. And the parties yes. are wired for vision and sound. And that's when the blackmail happens. Un, un, unknown to um, the kid that was groomed and recruited from uh, the boarding school. That's just my speculation. What do you think? No, I think you're absolutely right. Didn't they have those those same sort of parties at um, Dolphin Square? Was that it? And, and yeah, places like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, you hear about that in Washington. You can go to the parties. But don't stay for the after party because the after party is where the nonsense goes down. And next thing you know, you're with you're either, uh, you know, you've something's in your drink or maybe you're, hey, I'll have, you know, doing coke with, you know, some people. And next thing you know, you're you're in a, in a bedroom with someone that you thought was 18. It turns out she's 14 and they've got the pictures. And then those pick, you know, it'd be a shame if if this information got out. But I think we have a way to work w or with it. You know, maybe you vote our way in this next UN resolution or you. You, 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 you know, you, you forget about this evidence, you drop this and, and look this, this to the common person hearing this for the first time and they say, get out of here. You guys sound like a bunch of lunatics talking about this stuff, but this is how it runs. This is how it works. They can't leave this sort of thing up to chance. They've got to make sure that the decision makers are in their pocket and they don't want to be the ones in front of the cameras themselves. They prefer to stand back in the shadows because that's to their benefit that nobody really knows who they are. And I know that some people will say that sounds very convenient that these controllers are in the shadows, but, but think about it. This is where you would be if you were trying to run the world. You wouldn't want to be out front. You want people working on your behalf and, and just look at how these politicians are totally discarded. I mean, they, they serve their purpose and then they're thrown out or they're, if they play ball, then they get a job when they come out of politics, working for BAE systems or for Lockheed Martin as a, as an anal, you know, as a, as, as a, as a consultant and they play golf all day long with a bunch of people and that, and they get paid $3 million a year. And this, this is their job. And this is, this is, and if you work in Washington, DC for 
three decades, all this stuff seems normal. Like these people don't understand. You watch Joe Biden try to go out there on the campaign trail and connect with people during his speeches and people are scratching their heads going, what are you talking about? (laughs) Well, this is a man that's been in politics and his only job has been in Washington for 50 years. That's all he knows. And so he sounds, he sounds totally disconnected because he is And this, this little world. I mean, you mentioned about the, the pick about maybe the boarding schools being part of it. Isn't there a great picture where of of all the guys dressed in their tuxedos st- standing out there on the steps? There is. And you've got David Cameron yeah. and Boris Johnson and George yep. Osborne. That's right, the Bullingdon Club. That's yep. right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you're. I think you're right over the target there. I mean, n- is everybody in that picture up to no good? Well, maybe not. But 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 this happens in the U.S. It's skull and bones at Yale. I mean, you look at all the people that have come out of that group. And part of what it is is they get you start early. You get compromising dirt on these kids, and then you say, "This is how the game is played." I've got dirt on you. You're going to do what I say. They grow up and they realize that that these that the Leverage game uh, is just part of the way politics is played. Now, on the the extern, you know, people on the outside looking at this, they never dream of that. They they go, why did, why did Ted Heath sign away all of our fishing rights? I mean, yeah, what a bad deal. Yeah, yeah. Why would you agree? He did something like that. Well, oh, I don't know. Maybe because he was being blackmailed by the Germans. I mean, would that explain it? And you go, oh yeah. Well, that would make a lot more sense. So some of the times, people just need to kind of allow their minds to go to a little bit of a darker place and realize that that uh, the decisions that are being made by the people in positions of power, sometimes they're being told what to do. They have no choice. Or, you know, I would I would argue that some of them, like Madeleine Albright, you don't have to convince them too much to be uh, psychopathic because they are psychopathic. They are by you know, nature. Like, like talking about the, the price worth it, half a million dead Iraqi children and saying we think that the price is worth it. You didn't need to coach her on that. I think that she genuinely feels that because I think she's an empathy deficient psychopath. And unfortunately, they don't get the good guys like you, Richie, in positions of power because you'll screw up the game. They can't have that. They'll allow you to be on the radio, but you can't be in those positions. Thanks for that, Charlie. How did Kennedy get elected then? Was it solely down to the power of Joe Kennedy, his money and his connections to organized crime because I, I, I will believe to my dying day and it's only because of what I've read and I was lucky enough over the years to meet some um, um, very interesting men and women, um, obviously older men and women who had been around Kennedy and who had worked with him. I've interviewed uh, some of Kennedy's biographers and I do believe that Kennedy was genuinely not one of them. How did that happen? I feel the same way, and I and and I'm unlike you. I don't. I I wasn't alive when he when he was shot, and and I only know what I've seen, what I've read, and and it and of course it could be biased, but you get the feeling that that was the day that um, democracy died, if there ever really was democracy. But you you feel like that was when the 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 maniacs took over, right? They just. He w- he had too many ideas that were too that you know that conflicted with the existing power structure, and they just couldn't they couldn't tolerate that. There's you know that that's an area of research that I chose not to dig too much into, yeah, only yeah, because yeah, yeah. so many people have done a, a much better job than I could have ever done. Uh, but I'm fascinated by it because it does seem like you know, but it but like you said, Joe Kennedy was a these guys were, they were running alcohol, you know, That's he was right. no Bootlegan, choir yeah. boy. I mean, <laughs> right. he was, he was, uh, he was in it too. And, and, uh, and of course he was caught in, and Kennedy was blackmailed of course, you know, and, and, uh, so you never know, you never know how, how deep the rabbit hole goes, but, uh, but it seemed like when that happened, when, when he died, uh, part of a very important part of America died and it has never fully been, uh, resurrected from that. I am not in that group of people that think that Trump is here to save the day. I just, I've never, I, I don't see anything about that man that leads me to believe that he's, he's here to, uh, to be the orange hero riding in on a white horse. You know, I feel like he's sort of in it for himself. I don't know if the cavalry is coming, you know, to save, to save freedom and to save, you know, the rule of law and doing the right thing and all that. I, I, I feel like, it's it's even crazier now than it's ever been, and maybe with this upcoming election, 
You know, so is, is this going to get mad or uh, Charlie? Oh, let's stay with that for a few minutes. Charlie Robinson yeah. is our guest. I'm going to recommend uh, that you check out The Octopus of Global Control if you haven't read it. Do, do boy. It's, it's a terrific book. You won't regret it. Um, you'll read it and you'll read it again and you'll laugh and you'll be horrified and you'll laugh. Uh, it's a great read. It really is. Uh, Charlie is on Facebook. He's in uh, Facebook prison as it's known at the moment, but his Facebook page is The Octopus of Global Control. There's only one Charlie Robinson. He's on Twitter as well. I'll tweet where you can find him on Twitter um, and it's great to have him back on the programme. It must be devastating for people whom I don't lampoon, I don't mock them, I know you don't, I don't find it funny, I empathise and I feel sorry for them. It must be devastating for them because they believed this man when he said enough was enough, no more wars overseas, no more killing people overseas, no more imperialism, no more fighting wars, uh, interventionism is going to end, crooked Hillary will lock her up. It must be devastating for people to realise that it was a crock of shit, Charlie, excuse my French. Yeah. It must be hard for them to process that. And maybe there's something we can do with that. I don't know. What do you think? Well, th unfortunately, there's a lot of people that still haven't processed it, that they still are. There's like, well, he's he can't do it all. He can't do it all at once. He's got to, you know, he's got to have some time, uh, you know, or or he's got to have a second term. He's going to do it in a second term. It's like, stop, stop. He even if he wanted to do something about it, he's up against forces that he has no control over. He what's he going to do? Is he, He's going to stop these foreign wars. The, I mean, the military industrial complex will put a bomb in his car before the end of the week. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest about it. This is, this is, it, but, but I don't think that he's trying to, to be, to be completely fair. I do, I do not think that he's coming in with, with the intention of stopping this. Do I think Hillary Clinton would have been a better choice? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. I mean, not. But this is, yeah. this is, this is no choice. There's no choice between these two, these two people. And you see, you know, one of the things that, I, I really, you know, the people that, that say, well, Trump is, is, is draining the swamp, but it takes time and everything. Well, then my question is, if you're draining the swamp, please explain to me how you do that by putting John Bolton and oh, Elliot yeah. Abrams yeah, yeah, yeah. in charge of foreign policy when these guys should rightly be dying in a prison cell somewhere. You cannot convince me that he is on the side of of goodness and fairness and anti-war and all these things when you're making decisions to put these people in, in back in positions of power. And it is no exaggeration to say that Elliot Abrams is a convicted felon. He was found guilty in the Iran Contra. Uh, he was funneling guns. He was d responsible for death squads, death squads. This is not like he, he had a bunch of parking tickets. The guy was in charge of the, the crew Mass that murder. was murdering nuns and children and women all over Central America. And this guy's going to tell you how we're going to, we're going to help Venezuela. No, thanks. I'm fine. I mean, we don't need the, I mean, Venezuela, poor Venezuela too. You know, they've, they've got, they're blessed with oil. And then they found out that once America found out that Venezuela had oil, that becomes a, you know, a double-edged sword right now that everybody tries to steal it from you. And, uh, I'm just embarrassed of the behavior of my government. Uh, you know, I know you have, you're in the UK, obviously. It's the same I'd here. Like to, we, we hear the same crap, Charlie. It's the same nonsense, um, spouted in Westminster here about Venezuela. The same mm. lies told about the country, the same lies told about Maduro. And yet there yeah. seems to be a stalemate there. It's not happening as quickly. They wanted to put this Juan Guaido in. They wanted to start a revolution. They wanted Maduro to go into exile. It hasn't happened. And it's almost like the same with Syria. We, we can mm -hmm. be, maybe we can be positive for a few minutes. You know, they tried yeah. to um, um, usurp um, Syria, to sack Syria effectively by funding, arming and training a bunch of lunatic jihadis. And they did fund, arm and train lunatic jihadis. They did lay waste to great parts of Syria. But yet the Assad government endures and and uh, Nicolas Maduro, thank heavens, endures. Uh, it's not happening for these gangsters as quickly as they might like, Charlie. Can we, again, can we take something positive from that? Absolutely. So their tricks aren't working because we understand the game now. And we're vocal about it on in the alternative media and in social media and, and forums wherever we can. People are talking to one another. What, it's like a magician, right? Once you see the magician's trick, you're, you're trying to figure it out. Once they explain it to you, the trick doesn't work anymore. You go, oh, I know how he's doing that. He's actually got the bird in his left hand, not his right hand. And then they can never pull that trick on you anymore. So once you start calling out, oh, this Syria gas attack, this is a total false flag. This is 
you know, why would Assad gas his own people when he was on, you know, why would he snatch defeat from the jaws of victory? You know, this is, it doesn't make any sense. I bet you he does. I bet you they try and pull this again. Boom. It happens again. Told you it was going to happen again. And people are going, wow, are you psychic? You're like, no, I just understand what the plan is. This is so obvious. Can't you see that they're trying to pin this on them? And then the kind of the casual observer is like, well, yeah, it does seem a little fishy. And after a while, the Syria gas attacks don't work anymore. Then with Venezuela, I go, what a coincidence. They're going to fund Guaido, who nobody in the country had ever heard never of. Heard of no, no. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know who he was. Like, oh, he's the people's candidate. Really? Well, then why don't the people know who he is? And my fear, and I mentioned this on Renegade Inc. when I was on their, uh, on that show in RT, my fear is that They've tried to run a competitor, Guaido. Uh, that hasn't worked. Uh, they tried to put sanction on, on sanctions on Venezuela. That has worked to the extent that it's killed a bunch of people, but it hasn't con- it hasn't flipped the government. And my fear is that now that Guaido has run his course, that the logical step for the CIA would be to assassinate assassinate Guaido and pin that on Maduro as the pretext to justify a ground invasion and a regime change operation that, of course, the United States would lead, led by John Bolton and Elliot Abrams that we just talked about, these psychopaths that want war. So once you start to understand how the mechanics work and you call it in advance and you say, they're going to do this or don't fall for that or watch if they do this thing, and then it happens. Well, it takes away the surprise element. It takes away this uh, as being, um, you know, an effective tool that these these uh, people in positions of power are using. And let's be honest, they're they're not as creative as we give them credit. For. Oh, they're I can't really believe it, Charlie. Of, there, there must be telepathy going on here. I can't yeah. believe it. It's it's amazing you said that about them not being creative, because um, years and years ago, that was something that David Icke was saying. He was saying as capable of monstru- monstrous. Um, crimes and death and destruction as they are their playbook is fairly straightforward and they don't have the creativity to add to, 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 add to it and to adapt it it's amazing you saying that um, yeah. I, th- I think you're bang on it's a great point to make they keep doing the same things in the in different parts of the world every few years or every year and it doesn't change meaning that um, it should be more obvious to even greater numbers of people what's happening it must be a great time for us. It should be. We should be more positive, you know, to be able to highlight this. You do it brilliantly in your book. Look, folks, they do the same nonsense all the time. I love that analogy, Charlie. Hey, Charlie, how did you know that was going to happen? Because the bastards are doing it all the time. That's I've why. seen this movie before. Yeah, you know, this right. is like Godfather 3, right? They just yeah. keep, It's the same playbook. But, you know, and so, and I mentioned earlier that I was in Facebook jail, and, you know, we talk about the, alter, the social media and the crackdown on social media. And it's frustrating, and it's annoying, and, it, 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 and it's impacted a lot of people that, do, you, you know, yourself included, you know, that had large YouTube channels that they're throttling their subscriber yeah. list or they're, they're, they're shadow they're banning you and all these them, things. Yeah. And as awful as that is, and as frustrating as that is, there is one positive in that. They wouldn't be doing it if you weren't being effective. And all of us that are talking about this and sharing videos and, and spreading, you know, Hey, check, check out this radio broadcast. It's working. It's working, and they're freaking out. They have to. They have to stifle the the voices of people in the alternative media because they're too damn effective. So I t- I do take some positives out of this. It shows that we're on the right track. We just have to keep it up and keep it up and keep it up. But uh, the 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 thing that is a little bit alarming, well, I suppose a lot alarming, is that they have, although they aren't very creative, they have now brought in their partners from Silicon Valley to help with this silencing of dissenting voices. And that is alarming. Google's and Facebook's and Twitter's and things. And DARPA, Charlie. Like Tell us about DARPA, because DARPA is the technological wing of the Pentagon. RT did a story in the last couple of days saying that DARPA, I mean, this is absolutely sinister beyond belief, DARPA is now going to use artificial intelligence to basically start um, deleting things, uh, posts or stories deemed... Uh, to be fake. I mean, this is the Pentagon people. I mean, this is mad stuff. These are crazy what, times. Well, what, what, what could possibly go wrong yeah, there, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so DARPA is, is the um, 
the engineering arm of the CIA, right? They create the robots and they're, they're, they're building all these things. But there's another component too, which is a company called InQtel, and that is the venture capitalist arm of the CIA. And where they can't outright build the platforms and the machines themselves under the CIA logo, instead what they do is they finance them instead. So Google took money from uh, InQtel, Facebook took money from InQtel, uh, I think Twitter did as well. And so what it does is it gives the CIA a seat at the board of directors as well. And so, you know, when you put a lot of money in early stage, you get con- you get a s- voting rights in the, sh- in the stock, you get controlling, controlling interest. And in some cases like Facebook, uh, people have have accurately pointed out that the LifeLog program that the CIA started ended the same day that the Facebook project started with Mark Zuckerberg. So there's a uh, reason to believe that he is just a puppet and that in actuality, the CIA is running Facebook. And I would I would think that that is uh, for people that want to dig into more and more of that. James Corbett, the Corbett Report did a great uh 45 minute video about that. You can check that out. It's the role of Silicon Valley. And it's, it's, it's important because a lot of it is very under the radar. You don't really think about it, your day to day life, but now you, now you put the pieces together and go, well, that would explain why they're, able to just shut off the people that they don't want to have a voice because it really isn't Jack Dorsey's decision and it isn't, um, Sergey Brand and and Zuckerberg and all these guys that are the CEOs. It's, it's, it's the people above them. It's the people that are giving them money. It's in Qtel. It's Sequoia capital. It's these venture capital firms that have CIA ties and have ties to the Atlantic council and all these external think tanks that are really coming in and playing an oversized role in what gets a a voice and how the algorithm is tailored to make sure that these voices are heard and these other voices are not heard. And it's very damaging. And, uh, you know, it's obviously it's Orwellian. It's, it's beyond Orwell at this point. And unfortunately I I look at the social credit score of China and I get the feeling that we're headed that way. And that is very scary. And people think that that's coming. Oh, that's coming. That's coming. It's happening now in China. The future is now. Go to Shenzhen and see how the facial recognition system is tied into their social credit system. And if you're smoking on a train, by the time you get off that train, you get a, your cell phone dings and you've been fined, you know, whatever the fi- 50 bucks or, or whatever. It's already in China and it's definitely coming to the UK and to the United States. And it'll be these corporations, of course, rolling it out. Charlie, I want to ask you before we um, run out of time. Uh, thanks for sharing your time with us today, by the way. The Octopus of Global Control, people. It's a great book. Tell us um, briefly about you writing with uh, Jeff Berwick, uh, the anarcho-capitalist, um, who who's a terrific guy, runs Anarcho-Pulco, as you mentioned earlier on. Give us uh, the gist of what you're going to be writing about, uh, because I'm really intrigued, Charlie. Yeah, the working title for the book is The Controlled Demolition of the American Empire, and it is uh, obviously not a children's book. No, it's going to no. be heavy. It's it's talking about it, – it's it's looking into similarities of, of empires that have existed before, how they – you know, the, the, the cycles that they go through and where America is on these, you know, in conjunction or in, in relation to how these other empires grew and collapsed. And, you know, when you look at some of the, the spending, the central banking issues, societal issues, overextending through war, um, it's, you know, we're, we're standing at the brink of a collapse of the American empire I take no pleasure in saying that as an American, it is, um, it's one of those things that I've had to kind of come to come to grips with that we might live through this. Um, and the rise of China issues, it, you know, creates a threat. There's a, there's a Greek philosophy, um, called the Thucydides trap, which is the rise of a new superpower the the existing superpower always challenges it 75% of the time they go to war against them and so with china rising you see us the us uh, turning their attention to china and demonizing them and that gives me a great deal of anxiety because that will not end well for for either of us um, either china or well the world in general but uh, the united states and china in particular so it's a it's a it, it'll be an interesting book but we we'll, we we wrap it up in a in a very 
uh, positive way. And we're saying it's not over yet. You know, there's still, there's still time in this game. You know, we can still, um, we can, we can still have an effect. We can still turn the ship around, but it's going to require everyone to be awake to this and, uh, to, to remember that we have the power. We've got to take it back. There's so many more of us than there are of them. The psychopaths are in charge right now, but they need our, they need us to go along with the plan. And we always have to remember that, that we do have the right to not comply with them. We do have the right to say, we're taking our ball and going home. We didn't sign up for this nonsense. We're not on board with you guys. And we're not playing this game anymore. We don't like this world that you're creating. We want a different world. And it's part of it's up to us to, you know, to acknowledge that and then spread the news. And 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 so we we do end it in a positive note. There's lots to be optimistic about, but it's gonna require people to get out of their comfort zone and acknowledge that we've got a big problem and then set about to do something to change it. Brilliant, Charlie. I look forward to reading it and when it's um, published and when it's available. Um, I know you and Jeff will come on the program to chat with me. Uh, Charlie sure. uh, can be found on Facebook, The Octopus of Global Control, Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk. Uh, do get a copy of The Octopus of Global Control, the book. Uh, if you haven't read it before, it is terrific. And it's a book you can share with your loved ones, uh, the skeptics amongst your loved ones and your friends. Thanks for your time, mate, today. We covered a lot. That was the quickest uh, 45 minutes I've spent <laughs> in a long time, Charlie. Thanks. I really appreciate your time. You're uh, Thank a great you for having for me on, it. Richie. I love your show. I always have. You're a gent, Charlie. Thanks for that. The terrific Charlie Robinson live on the Richie Allen Show there from Denver. Top man, the octopus of global control. It nearly wraps up the programme. We've got about 60 seconds left uh, before we've got to depart. Uh, before we've got to part, you and I today, uh, Brexit and all of that, MPs against no deal won in the first vote in the House of Commons uh, around about quarter to six this afternoon, this evening, this afternoon, um, taking Boris Johnson's plan to leave without a deal away from him. The, the possibility that he could do that if he didn't get a deal with the EU, well, he won't be able to do that. And they will vote uh, real soon to um, force... Uh, they will vote real soon on whether or not to tell Johnson that he must seek a further extension beyond October 31st. This is all playing out the way yours truly said uh, it would. And later on still, there will be a vote on whether or not to schedule uh, a general election because Johnson, that's his proposed vote, needs two-thirds of MPs to back him. They won't, so he's going to lose that as well. But that doesn't mean at all that there will not be a general election. Uh, as was outlined earlier on, when we heard from Beth Rigby, uh, the uh, Sky News political editor. But I've been explaining it myself, how it works. It's going to be a fascinating evening again in Westminster. Big shout out to Tony Gosling. Uh, thanks to Tony. Thisweek.org.uk, the politics show on BCFM. And once again, Charlie Robinson, The Octopus of Global Control on Facebook. The book, The Octopus of Global Control, is a terrific read and you can find it online. Amazon uh, is about the best place to get it these days, I do believe. And that's it for me today. I think it's flown by. Thank you for listening as usual. Look after yourselves and one another. Have a terrific rest of your Wednesday. I've been Richie Allen. Back with you tomorrow at 9.30 on YouTube in the AM for the rather silly newspaper review. Until then, it's bye for me. Bye now. Wang Chung here.